new funding and that's where we'll spend the majority of our time tonight is looking at the new funding and AB 86 is divided into two different um, I often use the term buckets, um, pots of money, uh, streams of money. One is the in-person incentive grant. And the purpose of that is primarily to ensure that all schools are able to reopen for on-campus learning. Uh, we will um, take some questions after that. And then we'll focus a significant amount of our time tonight on the expanded learning opportunities uh, grant and they use the term grant but these are actually allocations and so then we'll be seeking your input and feedback as we share some of our preliminary ideas about um, strategies to support our students and then i will also touch in, touch on the elementary secondary and school emergency relief funds um, i try not to use acronyms but esser is the acronym for that i may use that occasionally tonight so uh, the elementary and secondary that's federal funds that were allocated uh, so i will explain all of these tonight and please know i will do my best to answer your questions know that i am learning support services and so that's my area of focus but i will also do my best to talk if you have um, specific budget questions all right uh, so christine Sure. Um, so um, throughout the course of the pandemic, we've held a lot of um, virtual parent meetings like this um, in kind of this webinar format to accommodate as many participants as we can. Um, that said, with a lot of participants, it can get a little crazy in the chat. So we've come up, you know, we've experimented with different ways on the best ways to gather feedback and have a conversation. And so today, um, Participation will be through our um, crowdsourcing platform, Thought Exchange. Some of you may be familiar with it. We use it um, every year um, with our LCAP. We also gather feedback regularly, you know, on everything from, you know, how are we doing on distance learning to what should we do for graduations? That was all last year. So um, in order to participate and give feedback and for us to be able to collect that data, but also for you as participants to see what everyone else is saying, to have more of a dialogue and to be transparent with all the questions coming in, um, we'll be we'll be basically doing Q and A live that way. So the way you'll participate is you can either have your um, smartphone or tablet handy if you want to scan the QR code that's coming up, or we'll share the link in the Zoom chat as well, so you can always click directly from your computer or device, and it's really easy to participate. All right, thank you. So we're, we'll begin with a look back at the CARES fund, uh, COVID relief fund that was funding that was allocated to Poway Unified this school year. And so um, teachers and other classified uh, staff was a significant amount. And let me explain a little bit why we were one of the few districts that already had a homeschool program in our district and available. And so we were able to provide um, on-campus learning, virtual learning, homeschool option, and independent study. Um, what happens when we had over 600 families choose homeschool, we needed to staff that program, and many of our uh, existing teachers opted to teach in the homeschool program, and so we had to backfill. And as you know, when you are staffing, um, things don't come in neat little boxes. And so I'll use the example of, let's say a Black Mountain Middle School. And if three of their teachers opted to go to teach in independent study or the homeschool program, then it didn't necessarily mean that the teacher, the students from <clears throat> the sections that those three teachers teach all day followed to homeschool and independent study or virtual. So we needed to backfill. And so we needed to hire um, just over 30 additional teachers to make sure that we could staff the options that we offered to our families. And so that is why um, that's why those uh, expenditures were required. And so you can see teachers and certificated salaries, classroom supervision, classified salaries, trying to ensure that we had instructional assistance on campus and supporting virtually. Um, and then benefits is a separate line item in our budget. So you can see that those employees that were hired um, uh, either full time or over uh, four hours 
qualified for benefits. So that was also part of the expense. Uh, you can see PPE, personal protective equipment and safety supplies. Um, you know that Power Unified um, <clears throat> provided a significant amount of PPE very early on, um, the plexiglass. And I know that, you know, as we always look back hindsight, if we know, knew then what we know now, perhaps we wouldn't have purchased as much plexiglass, but at the time, we were making decisions to ensure that our students and staff would be safe. And so it was the ensuring that we had the plexiglass desk shields for all of our students and staff stations. And then also um, safety supplies like the uh, electrostatic sprayers for all of the campuses, the additional hand sanitizer stations that we have installed at all of our campuses, uh, and so on, in addition to masks and uh, decals and um, that would help with the physical distancing. Technology and distance learning, uh, as you all probably participated in the Chromebook pickups uh, that we scheduled, we had to ensure that because we opened completely virtual, we had to ensure that each and every student had a Chromebook. And so we did need to purchase some. We utilized as many Chromebooks that we could, that we had in hand. However, some of those were also nearing end of life. So we did need to purchase additional. Um, and then additional um, social emotional support. So extending some of the support hours for our student support specialists, uh, counselors, and psychologists to ensure that we had the support necessary to serve our students. And then support for meals. And you might ask, why did we need support for meals when they are uh, meals are being provided uh, free? And so when we think about that, um, it's beautiful and we're very glad that we've been able to provide the free meals uh, to all of our students. However, that means that there's no income coming into food and nutrition this year. And so we're paying salaries, but we have no income. And one of the things that often supports is of course the income, but also like the a la carte meals at secondary. Those are um, great sources of income that we do not have this year. So we did need to support our food nutrition department. So you can see that that CARES Act funding came to about 28.4 million. And then in December, we received an additional allocation, uh, federal, allocate, federal allocation of about $7 million. And all of those funds I just spoke to had been expended, but these funds came at a time when we were navigating how do we cover the staffing needs now at Middle and High School. And so the timing of that was perfect because it allowed us to hire a significant number of limited term instructional assistants, additional substitutes to cover so that we could implement our concurrent model and ensure that students that wanted to come on campus would have supervision on campus. So that's a look back at the funding that we received this to support this school year starting in July, 2020 through uh, current time. All right, so now we'll move into our um, focus of the night is looking at the Assembly Bill 86 state funding. And you can see here that these funds um, are to be expended spring 2021 and they must be spent by, by August 2022. So they are a short term um, funding source. So let's take a look at um, the two different uh, pockets of money or um, uh, sources of funds. In-person incentive grant, as I mentioned at the beginning, is really focused on ensuring that schools that hadn't yet opened <clears throat> are able to do so. And Powell Unified opened our elementary schools in October and had kids on our middle and high schools uh, shortly thereafter in targeted groups. And then we opened uh, for on-campus in March. And so we feel that our PPE um, we may need to continue to buy masks if those are still required, but we will have those on hand. But thinking about what we've learned in, as we've reopened and opened our modified schedule for elementary, bringing our AB cohorts together, and when we um, put our um, combined our AB cohorts at middle and high school, one of the number one questions that we heard from both parents and staff was, what about physical distancing? in our classrooms. And so based on those questions and that interest, 
we feel that the um, using the in-person incentive grant to focus on health and safety and utilize those funds to reduce class sizes as possible. And as you can see here, the cost of reducing class size at one grade level in Poway Unified based on our enrollment is approximately $1 million. So currently our fourth and fifth grade classes is, are capped at 33 students. And so if we reduce to 32 students, that would be $1 million uh, to hire extra teachers just for fifth grade, another million for fourth grade. And if we reduce by two students, then it would be a total of $4 million. <clears throat> And looking at Midland High School, the um, formulas and staffing is a little bit more complex, as you can imagine, not just more students, but a master schedule that is more complex. And so to reduce class size at Midland High Schools, we are working with our site leaders to take a look at which classes and specific courses are typically at the cap or the target of 38 kids in class. And I know that I have seen classes as large as 40 in some of our classes. And so what we want to do is ensure that we can look at those classes and ensure that students can be physically distanced to the extent possible and um, perhaps add additional sections. So a class like um, integrated to mathematics at high school, um, uh, I believe all students take that class. And so that is a class that may be um, at capacity. So if we add an additional section or two at a high school, that could reduce the class size across all of the integrated two cl classes. So we're gathering that input. The other classes that we're looking at is when we have our collab classes that have our students with IEPs um, included and general ed students because we're um, combining some classes. So we want to look at how might we um, target and provide support for those classes that have the greatest impact uh, as far as numbers. So the focus of this is health and safety and ensuring that we can have some level of physical distancing. Currently, the guideline is three feet between students in class and six feet from the teacher. So we want to be able to continue because we feel that would help. We have um, quite a few students that are remaining virtual and we want everyone to feel comfortable and safe returning on campus. All right, so Christine, you want to talk? Yes, so we'll pause right now for questions. Um, what are your questions, if you have any, um, about this portion that we covered about reducing class sizes with the in-person incentive grant? Um, I put the link in the chat to um, where you can enter your questions or you can also scan this QR code on your screen with your smartphone or tablet camera. Uh, it's anonymous, um, really easy to participate. You can just start inputting um, each individual question. And as they come in, you can also um, rank questions that you definitely want answered and those will rise higher up and we'll get to as many questions as we can um, before moving on on this topic, um, reducing class sizes with the in-person incentive grant. So we'll pause for a minute for you to get that going. And Carol, let's leave that up just for a bit. Okay, so I see participant numbers going up in that exchange and some thoughts coming in. And you may have seen some thoughts that were in the chat, um, some questions that were already populated. We did this presentation last, last evening with our district advisory committee. So they also had an opportunity to ask questions. And so you may see some of those questions that are already populated. If you share those questions, go ahead and just star those questions so that they rise to the top and that's we'll try to address some of those. Okay, so I'll share my screen because I see some questions coming in. Oh, 
Okay, Ms. Osborne, uh, let me refresh one more time. All right. First question, um, will the lack of available classrooms on campuses be a hurdle to reducing class sizes? So that was our first question as well when we started planning for this. So we worked with our facilities planning department and looked at all of our elementaries to see um, what the capacity is. And we are uh, happy to report that we are able to um, decrease class sizes by at least a couple of students uh, and that we can uh, accommodate those at all of our elementary schools. Our middle and high schools are a little bit more complex. The, they, they are typically using all of their classrooms on a given year, but what we can do is utilize uh, some of the classrooms during prep periods and so on, and so to try to be creative in how we use the space at our middle and high schools. Um, we have uh, one, what is the estimated class size for the year 2021-22? Um, I guess this is assuming that we have the um, lowering of the class sizes in place with the grant. Right, so it would be um, kindergarten, uh, TK and kindergarten would remain at uh, 25 and 26, first grade through third grade would remain at 26. We're looking at keeping those the same because the, class size, the classrooms can hold those students and they can be three feet apart. Uh, we are currently with 33 at the cap for fourth and fifth grade, we're looking at reducing those to 31 or 32. And then at middle and high school, the target cap for classes is 38. And sometimes that's a target. So sometimes, as I mentioned, they do get to 40. So we want to um, look at what is possible. And I think that we would be trying to look at, can we keep those under that cap of 38 that cap was set because of you know, space and classroom. So we would be trying to make sure that they could be under 38 as possible. How will extra classes be set up if schools don't have the space? So I think that would be, as I mentioned at middle and high schools, it might be teachers sharing classrooms. So it might be that um, using classrooms during prep period where teachers would have their prep instead of in their classroom, they may be in a common learning space so that we could have students using those classrooms and not being empty during those periods. What is the plan for sustaining these changes or cutting them off due to the funding being only available for a limited time? So, so that is uh, our question as well as we've been doing this planning is to think about um, you know, sustainability. And we recognize that this would be a one year class size reduction to ensure the distancing between students. And so these would be temporary contracts that we would provide to teachers um, for this year. We do know that each year we are hiring new teachers. And so, um, you know, we would be taking that risk of having uh, temporary teachers, but hopefully they would be able to um, continue on as impact teachers in the future and then eventually be become permanent teachers, but it would be temporary contracts that would be offered to some teachers. And in some cases, it might be that uh, at middle or high school, it might be that we have some teachers teach an additional section. And so then we would be paying those teachers extra for teaching an additional section. So there are a variety of ways to address that, but it um, would be for one year. What makes reducing class sizes so expensive in particular? It's the teachers. And so that's teachers' health, uh, teacher salary and uh, benefits, health and welfare. And so that's why when you reduce and our district with 26 elementary schools, that's why it's $1 million because there's um, how many classes at fifth grade across 26 elementary schools. What's enrollment looking like across the different learning options for next year? So we are still gathering that data. We are looking that the Connect Academy is um, uh, getting populated. Uh, parents are choosing that. So we will have teachers assigned to Connect Academy. That will be the K-8 virtual learning. Um, Poway Homeschool is much less than what it was this past year. So some of those teachers will be returning to to their um, previous home the uh, previous school site. Um, however, some will stay. I haven't seen the numbers today, um, but it, typically homeschool was about 35 students. 
last year it was over 600. And I believe that we are um, around getting close to 75 students in uh, at the last time I checked. Yeah, so the, the independent learning, the homeschool, those have are going down significantly. So the question about possibly moving those teachers back to some of the class size reductions. That's correct. Yeah. Um, I think you addressed the class sizes in middle school, correct? Yes. Yeah, so they are, I think their target is uh, sixth through eighth grade. They have a target of 34. So they were um, sometimes upwards of 36, 37 kids. So again, we'll be working to try to stay with that target of 34 kids. Um, and, and so and looking at those classes that were typically large. I know that PE at middle school is probably your largest class, but that is outside most of the time. And so those would be um, continue to probably be your largest classes, but they are able to physically distance outside. Um, why aren't you reducing class sizes for the younger grades? So why is it fourth grade and up? Uh, because as we put our AB cohorts together at fourth and uh, for um, the April uh, 26th reopening with the modified schedule, the upper grades with 33 kids in a class were the challenges that we had to try to get all of the desks um, distanced by three feet. The, we didn't hear that concern at the primary classes. They were able to arrange their desks and tables so that kids could be three feet apart. Um, there are more questions, but I do know that you it's the next section is very meaty. So I want to be able to th there's some important information that you have. So let's move on to the next. All right. So expanded learning opportunities grant. So this again, these funds are for one year. And this is um, a plan that has to be developed and uh, presented to the board. It'll go to the board on May 13th. As I mentioned at the beginning, these are funds that are allocated for spring 2021 through August 2022, they must be spent. And there are seven categories that are identified by the California Department of Education as learning support strategies for us to consider as supports. Districts are not required to have strategies for all seven categories. And uh, as you'll see, we have some strategies that may overlap, but we wanted to, um, we, we do have some, strat some uh, preliminary plans in each of the seven categories. So I'm gonna go through all seven and we'll pause um, with the QR code for um, feedback will be on each of the slides, but these are the seven strategies for supplemental instruction and support for student learning. And so um, I'm not gonna read these to you right now because I have a slide for each one of these that I will go through in detail. Because this section is long, we wanted to front, you, front load you with the link to submit your questions as we go along because something might occur to you in the middle of a slide. And so um, here is the QR code for the next set of questions. I'll also put it in the chat. And so if anything comes up along the way, please start adding your questions because at the end we'll pause and try to get to as many questions as possible as time allows. And as Carol mentioned, the QR code is on each slide. So if something occurs to you right then, you can scan it or click on the link in the chat. Thank you. All right, so the first uh, focus area is extending instructional learning time. And so what you may have heard at other board meetings is that we are looking to be able to offer summer school. Poway Unified has not offered a K-8 summer school. Uh, we've offered um, special ed summer school for students with disabilities based on their IEP uh, each summer, but we have not been able to afford to offer summer school to other students. So we are planning for uh, it's actually a K-12 offering, but a, a, spe a specific K-8 summer school will have eight elementary sites and one middle school site, and we'll be able to provide that option in the summer of 2021 and summer 2022. Uh, we will also have a targeted English learner summer school 
that we'll have elementary classes, middle school classes, and high school classes dedicated just to our English learners so that they can continue to work on language development, oral and written. And then a summer bridge program for incoming ninth graders. This is something that um, in the past, many years ago, we were able, able to provide. It's a support for uh, incoming ninth graders to consider to come on campus, become acclimated, have some information provided about what does it look like at high school? What, to, what are my study skills? What do I which I expect in homework. And they spend about a week on campus learning about the high school life and how to be prepared for success at high school. Uh, one of the suggestions that we received last night was, you know, our incoming ninth graders, yes, they need support, but what about incoming 10th graders who may have been virtual all this year and they've never been on the high school campus? So that was a wonderful suggestion. And so we will be building that in to see if we can offer um, to both our ninth and 10th graders because high school is different. And what we saw this year with uh, DNF rates is that for some of our ninth graders, it was that's where our greatest area of need was um, with the D's and F's. And so it's because they um, weren't familiar with the um, homework load and the study skills that they need in, in high school. So we are pleased that we'll be able to provide that summer bridge program. Um, credit recovery summer school is something that we provide each summer, but um, we will be able to expand that so that students are invited by their counselor to attend uh, for credit recovery. And then also we are offering for the first time, um, we're labeling them enrichment courses, but these are courses so that if students are in um, ASB or athletics or um, BAN and they want to have um, some flexibility with their schedule and be able to take uh, additional electives or something, we're going to offer some Poway virtual courses this summer so that high school students could take a course this summer and then not have to take it during the regular school year. And that also helps to address the emotional well being of students when they think about their caseloads and course loads. And, and if they can take a course this summer that maybe they, um, maybe it's not their passion, so they can just focus on that one course, that will support our students as well. So, yeah. You skipped the um, youth enrichment program, oh, which I know there's there's high interest in also. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, the youth enrichment program is a program that we have offered each summer, and it's been a fee-based program that our families have had to pay for. This summer, we will be offering it at no cost. There may be, I think, a small registration fee, but we wanted to ensure that students would have access to the enrichment program. So that is an open registration. Summer school for um, K-8 English learner, uh, the credit recovery, we will be um, trying to provide support to our students with greatest needs. So we have been looking at uh, achievement data this uh, last couple of weeks to identify which students have priority for summer school. We will send those invitations out. And then if there are additional spaces, we'll open it up to others so that we can ensure that um, our students with greatest need have access as a priority. Um, during the school year, we're also planning for supports. Um, our elementary teachers, our elementary schools typically fund impact teachers to provide push-in support or small group support for students that need that additional dose of learning. And so um, those supports, the site-based impact teachers will continue. So if a school site, I know as a principal, I used to hire um, at least two, sometimes three, that we will provide an additional impact teacher to each of the elementary sites so that it is added support for more small group, more support in class um, so that students have that um, small group attention and support with an additional teacher. And then we'll also be looking at offering before and or after school tutoring for students that are interested and that we'll be recruiting teachers and instructional assistants to be paid extra, paid hourly to support students. It could be their students or it could be a math teacher is staying at middle school and so um, math students are able to stay and get support. Uh, it may be a language arts teacher doing some additional writing support um, for her students, students and or other students as well. So that'll be we'll be seeking teachers and instructional assistants to um, provide that during the school year support. 
The next category is accelerating progress to close gaps <clears throat> through learning supports. And so when we think about accelerating if kids are behind or kids are close to grade level but need to catch up or review, that we look at our personalized learning programs. And so we will be continuing to fund iReady, both English language arts and mathematics for grades one through eight. We will keep Lexia, excuse me. <clears throat> we will keep Lexia, <clears throat> excuse me, for our TK and kindergarten classrooms. We um, have a, a multi-year contract for Lexia. So that's not on here because it's not being funded by the expanded learning. Um, so iReady, that continuity of iReady will also ensure that the assessments that we use this year that we'll be able to continue to use the same type of assessments and we'll be able to monitor and um, target instruction using a common assessment that we'll be able to also look at how are these interventions supporting students? Are they working? What needs to be adjusted? And so we will be um, continuing with iReady. And for those of you that may be familiar with MAP, that Power Unified used for many, many years. We stopped using that this year because it was not able to be utilized in a virtual environment. So iReady is more flexible. Then we're also looking at Imagine Learning licenses for our, um, for our English learners during the school year. And Imagine Learning is, was recommended by our English learning, learner uh, TOSA and some of our um, EL, uh, supports at the uh, teachers at the school sites that this program is specific for English learners. And so we're piloting it at two schools currently. And so we wanted to make that available to other English learners throughout the school year next year. And then considering middle and high school intervention and support classes, um, we see the term accelerated math classes. And I know um, some may think of that as um, to go above grade level, but we use that as a accelerated math class as an intervention class. And the way we currently use that, and it's at most schools, but um, they typically don't have enough sections for all of the students that need it. So we would add additional sections. If I'm a student and I struggle in math, that I would have an accelerated math class right before my core math class and with the same teacher so that I can preview and review the learning in that class and have greater success when I then go into my regular math class. And then we're looking at the same as trying to provide that same kind of support in um, English language arts and accelerated classes for language arts. And so these are at both middle and high schools. This is a strategy that we're very excited about as well. This is um, integrated supports to address other barriers to learning. And I think that we're all quite familiar with the stress and impact of students being isolated at home during the virtual time and um, just the, the impact of COVID on our students. And so we'll be using a significant amount of funding to support mental health. So you can see here, we will be hiring social workers at Midland High School. This is brand new to Poway. We have not um, had social workers on our campuses in the past. And so that's an additional intervention and support that we will have available at each middle and each high school. And I know that counselors are invaluable to the support that they can provide to our students. So we will be adding counseling time at elementary. Some sites only had two days a week with their counselor. Um, so that's, and it's based on enrollment. And so for small elementary sites, they'll be getting that an additional day. Um, each each uh, elementary based on enrollment. So some sites had three, they'll have four days a week. And then we're also adding our current um, middle schools had, I believe it was two and a half counselors. We're bumping that up. So there'll be full-time counselor, um, additional counselors at middle school as well. Also adding an additional psychologist and then our student support specialist at Middle and High School, they provide um, small group support and uh, intervention um, classes for students as well and push into classes, but also hold group sessions. 
So we will be increasing their hours. They're typically less, <clears throat> less than 20 hours a week. So we're trying to make that full time. And then our student support assistants at elementary as well. Those student support assistants at elementary do the second step lessons. And those are uh, well-being, social, emotional lessons. They typically don't have time to do all of those lessons during the year because of their limited hours. So now we'll be able to expand that learning time for students with second step. <clears throat> The additional supports are building in, um, expanding some of the parent education classes. We've had um, classes on reducing stress and anxiety for students. We've had uh, vaping, not just, um, stop vaping classes uh, for parents, a variety of different education classes that have been provided. We want to expand those. Um, and then also adding additional district nurse, as you know, during COVID time, that is critical for us to have that support. And then, one of the things that has come um, up from um, throughout this time is some of our families that are homeless, our youth in transition, uh, childcare, as parents are trying to secure the uh, uh, source, resources they need for their family, we wanted to dedicate funds so that we could provide ESS scholarships for our youth in transition students. It gives them a more stable environment before and after school. It relieves that worry and concern of parents trying to figure out what they're gonna do because if they do have a job, but they don't have childcare. So we'll have those ESS scholarships for students that are currently homeless. And then also looking at expanding current connections, uh, caring connections resources and looking at um, uh, parent liaisons, as well as um, trying to increase hours and supports for our families through caring connections. Community learning hubs to provide access. So we, um, we have been able to provide the majority of our families that had needs for access to Wi-Fi support, but we know that some of our high schools keep their library or their tech center open. We wanted to ensure that all of our high schools could have that option to have a space on campus with after school hours so, so students want just had a place, a quiet place where they could do their homework. Uh, we wanted to uh, support the Family Learning Center that is shared by Mount Carmel and Los Penn so that we can ensure that those um, spaces are available for our students after school. And then um, again, this is similar to what we just saw on the last slide is caring connections uh, parenting classes, and we'll be seeking input from parents about what type of classes and, and sharing some options that might be available. So this is a strategy that um, you heard me discuss earlier when we talked about summer school. So this strategy, it's not that additional funding, but it's just this strategy works both as extended learning time but also for credit deficient students. So it is included in both sections. So um, the high school summer school, supporting students with credit recovery, if they make up that class in the summer, it replaces the D or the F on their transcript. And then during the year support, the same thing can happen during the year if a student is taking um, an off role, but they perhaps had uh, a D or an F in a class, they're able to take classes through the Edgenuity program that we utilize and so they can go in and test in Edgenuity and just complete the section of the course that they perhaps failed. So if they failed certain unit or units, they can just do those um, makeup units in Edgenuity and they can within a time period make up those classes and remove that DRF from their transcript during the school year. And then we'll also, as I mentioned, have the access to additional counseling services. And when we think about helping students look at their graduation requirements, being prepared for college, those additional counseling services and supports will be there. And because we have social workers supporting at high school that we've not had, that also allows our um, high school counselors to be able to dedicate time to students in ways they may not have in the past. Um, as many of you may know that um, Poway Unified has been facing a structural deficit for the past several years. And so each year, I know this is my third year, um, each year we've been looking at reductions and um, 
budget reductions across programs. And so one of the programs we were concerned about was exploration. Um, we will be able to use some of our expanded learning funds to maintain uh, ex exploration. It was, um, we'll have 13 sessions per school and our exploration teachers, I think currently we have 18, we'll have 20 for next year. Um, and those teachers do partner with um, outside organizations for VAPA and PE and STEM. So they engage in professional learning to build their knowledge and skills and um, units dedicated to these areas of um, visual and performing arts, PE and STEM. So we will be able to maintain exploration program for elementary. And then we want to, this last session, um, it says training. I like to use the term professional learning. Uh, professional learning for staff to engage students and families in addressing academic and social emotional needs. So um, we've been partnered with Peer Edge this year, and that has been strategies that teachers can use for their well being, as well as teach our students in the classroom. So we would like to continue to deepen those strategies. So we'll have professional learning available for staff prior to the school year beginning. Um, as you know, we have now, we are a one-to-one -one district with Chromebooks. So how do we ensure that when kids are back on campus, we utilize technology intentionally and mindfully so that it's not um, kids on the screen all the time, but how do we perhaps when a teacher is working with small groups, have students do something perhaps on their Chromebook that is powerful learning opportunities and personalized. Um, differentiated learning strategies as well. How do we ensure that our students that are at and above grade level, that the teachers are um, aware and utilizing and implementing strategies to accelerate and challenge our students that are above grade level, as well as differentiating for students that may be below. But we wanna make sure that each and every student, wherever they are in the learning path, has learning opportunities at their point of need. Engagement strategies, we worked a lot on engagement strategies through virtual learning, but now coming back into the classroom, how do we maintain some of those and what do we look at so that we can ensure that students are um, engaged in deep thinking opportunities and conversations. When we think about kids that may have been isolated, um, staying at home and not engaging um, in conversations face-to-face -face with kids, we want to, with other kids, we want to make sure that we are putting those supports in place. Trauma-informed care is something we have worked on in the past, provided professional learning. We want to continue to provide that learning opportunity for staff because we do know that um, our students have a uh, um, experience trauma in some instances, some have lost loved ones due to COVID. And so we wanna make sure that our teachers are prepared to create that um, caring and uh, supportive classroom. Elementary PE, we saw that on our LCAP thought exchange that we uh, elementary parents wanted more PE. So we do provide some PE through exploration, but as I said, that will only be 13 times during the year. But we also want to provide some uh, professional learning for our classroom teachers to lift their lessons when they take kids outside for PE, that it's more um, standards-based and um, targeted learning for physical education. And then restorative practices focusing on uh, discipline and when there may have been um, infractions between two students or an incident that instead of just giving consequences that we help students learn from the mistakes, we bring them together to heal the relationship with the student that they may have had an altercation so that we can continue to create that caring environment and a healthy culture for all students. All right, so that is the seven strategies. I'm going to uh, pause. Um, let me just highlight this piece. I think I've said this a couple of times that the funds need to be expended by August, 2022. And so, um, and I mentioned about summer school will be this summer and next summer. And then the supports will be provided during the school year. One of the biggest questions is, what about sustainability? Wow, it's, you know, we're gonna have these things in place this year, then what? And so that's been our question as well, because we want to be able to continue to support and, so, and utilize these strategies in um, the out years after 2022 of uh, August 2022, 2022, sorry. 
Um, so the fund that I mentioned at the onset on the agenda, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds, those funds can be utilized through the school year 2023. And so we'll be able to have, I, and I, I want to say, um, it's actually 2024, I apologize for that mistake. Um, so we'll be able to use the elementary uh, and secondary school relief funds to sustain not all of the strategies, because as I mentioned, the reduced class size will be for one year with that in-person incentive grant, but we will be able to maintain our counselors and uh, social workers and maintain some of the um, tutoring and some of the other supports because we will not utilize um, the emergency relief funds necessarily next year, but we will have those for the 2022-23 school year and the 2023-24 school year so that we'll be able to sustain some of these strategies uh, for several years. We are also hopeful and optimistic that the focus that the federal and state have been looking at with mental health supports and student learning supports is that there may be continued funds being made available to schools to continue to provide this level of support. So uh, we remain optimistic so that we will be able to um, put strong strategies in place and then also be able to maintain. All right, I will pause and Christine, I'll let you take the screen to see if there are questions. Thanks, Carol. Um, let me put the link one more time to submit um, any feedback or questions around this section, the expanded learning strategies and supports um, that Ms. Osborne went over the seven strategies. I know it was a lot and I saw the questions coming in as you were speaking. So let's get right to those questions so we can tackle as many as possible in our 10 minutes remaining. Okay, let me refresh. <laughs> okay, uh, what is the amount of AB 86 funds avail available to PUSD? Do you have a total, Carol? I do. The um, total for in-person instruction is about 10.5 million. And so that's the amount that we are looking at using for reducing class size to ensure students can be physically distanced. And then expanded learning opportunities is about 22.7 million. And 15% um, of that can be spent on virtual. Um, the other 85% is to be spent on campus. And of that 85%, 10% is dedicated to paraprofessionals. So uh, in-person instruction is 10.5 million. Expanded learning is 22.7 million. And our um, uh, elementary and secondary emergency relief funds are about 19.3 million. Thank you. Um, this is more of a comment. You cannot keep training teachers to do more and more and more. They're humans, not program programmable machines. Right. So some of the topics I mentioned in strategy seven um, were um, deepening some of the things that we, we worked on this year, but um, I appreciate that. Um, the suggestion is more funding for art um, as a way to target mental health. Um, how will it be determined what training teachers receive? Will it be based on interest, need, or personal preference? And of course, will it be mandated or during paid time or optional? So uh, last year, we created a professional development catalog, which included a couple of hours of team time, and it was outside the contract year. So it is additional hours um, that teachers are paid for um, to attend. And so it's choice, but we, we put specific ones. And then this year, we identified some that for some of the new programs, like we used iReady for the first time. So that was a required session. Uh, Synergy had some upgrades of how we took attendance. That was a required, but those were smaller uh, requirements of time, but it will be teacher choice. How many weeks will the summer school be? So high school summer school starts the 
second to the last week of June, I believe, and it goes through July. Um, the K-8 summer school will be uh, four weeks and students could enroll for a two week session or all four weeks. Uh, so that will be, uh, K-8 will be in July. And then addressing that other question right there related, what's the planned summer school for the elementary level? Will it be full day or half? It'll be half day. So they just landed on those hours today. It'll be 8.30 to 11.30. Okay. Can you specify the total hours for school psychologists versus counselors versus, versus social worker coverage at elementary schools? Well, that's a good question. Uh, typically our school psychologists are assigned to more than one school site. I don't know the specific um, number of hours. Our school counselors are full-time and we, believe, uh, we are contracting to have the full-time social workers at middle and high school. Um, how will the social workers be hired? What would that look like in terms of support, I guess, for sure. average, middle, or high school student? So what we did is we um, are learning from some of our surrounding districts. And so we reached out to uh, a high school district that, uh, or secondary district, that currently contracts with um, a social work uh, company. And so they are um, trained to work on school campuses. And so we'll be uh, contracting with a company that the social workers that have, have experience working at schools and that they would be um, working at our middle and high schools. I know a question came last night about how will you identify who works with? And I think that our students sometimes express needs, but then we also will need to have some level of opportunity for us to do check-ins with students and do some simple surveys to do some check-ins about how students are doing and who might need some support. Do, you, do we have to pay the same rate for iReady for kids who are just using it for assessment, uh, i.e. sixth through eighth? So this year the pricing was different and we just paid for the diagnostic at six through eight. And so we um, worked with the company so that we could get a multi-year deal and also have, because I heard from a lot of um, middle school English language arts teachers that they wanted to have the activities as well so that students could have those personalized learning paths and targeted support based on where they were. So we are looking at having that support available so students would have the learning path and the assessment. But has, has feedback been gathered from students and parents to support the continuation of exploration? Uh, it's come up through our thought exchange. We haven't done a specific survey about exploration, but I know that um, our teachers this year didn't have the release time and have missed having that type of uh, uh, collaboration time. So that's a good uh, question. And that will be something that we can look at making sure that we gather uh, like a 360 survey on exploration from students, staff and uh, families. Um, this question was answered in the chat, where to find information on the upcoming youth enrichment program. Um, registration opens May 4th, and I put a link in the chat um, to link to the courses that you can preview. Um, are you confident teachers will volunteer to staff all those extra programs? They've had a tough year too. Yeah, and that's where I think that we want to be flexible with that. And it might be that, um, you know, teachers only do, you know, a couple of hours after school and maybe they just do it in the fall and then another teacher does it. And, and so maybe we can create, our idea would be to create schedules. I know we won't have 100% of our teachers and their well-being is also important. So um, we will um, do our best to staff and make sure that the needs are available, for, uh, support is available for our students. We also, you know, we could look at hourly teachers and we could look at um, impact teachers who may be interested in additional hours. Are there enrichment courses or programs offered virtually? I, I think specifically for summer. Uh, I think just at the high school level, right? Just at the high school with the Poway virtual courses is that that's the only enrichment that is virtual. We will have iReady available during the summer, but we don't have other courses for them. Um, same question on sustainability after this year on impact teachers, tutors, IAs, social workers, et cetera. Do we have longer term budget plans? I think you addressed kind of the three year yeah. plan, yeah. but beyond that, yeah. Uh, which elementary schools will the summer school be offered at? Do we know yet? 
Uh, I don't have that in front of me, but I, what we're trying to do is ensure that it's regional. And so I think that uh, I, I don't have that right in front of me right now. Um, we'll announce it very shortly. So um, after this meeting, um, either Friday or Monday, we will send a communication to all families, hopefully with additional details, um, you know, wrapping up the details that were shared in this meeting, as well as um, any additional information. So we'll continue to keep families informed. Um, how much are we spending on iReady? Do we need that program for every student? Uh, it's a personalized program, and so it, it does support students that are above grade level so that they can continue to advance. Um, and so I think that um, we feel it does provide value, but I think like the question that came up about expiration is perhaps we need to get some feedback from students as well. And I think, you know, this year, the amount of screen time that some of our students have had that that is probably one more um, screen that they are working on. So hopefully when we're back on campus full time, that'll balance that out a little bit, but. I think I wanna leave a little time for the end of the meeting as we wrap up. All right. So just to kind of finalize, so, um, I know when I get information like the amount that has been shared with you tonight, um, often I continue to think about and percolate and have ideas. So we will continue to leave these thought exchanges that you've used um, tonight. We'll keep those open. If uh, I know sometimes in the middle of the night, I think, oh, I should have asked about that. So it'll stay open for you. Um, and then we will be closing um, all of the thought exchanges on May 5th uh, and then, um, looking at all the input that you've provided for us tonight, um, going back and looking at those plans, looking at some of the questions you've had um, to look and um, revise and uh, update our preliminary plan, present that to the board at the May 13th meeting. And then, as I mentioned, those AB 86 funds um, will finish in August 22, and that's when we'll start utilizing the um, elementary secondary emergency relief funds. All right. Uh, this was the thought exchange that went out last week in the communication. Um, so again, if there are additional strategies, this is an option for um, us to continue to hear from you. And we appreciate the time that you have spent with us tonight and your interest in providing feedback and input on the expanded learning opportunities. So that is um, all the information that we have for you tonight. We appreciate uh, your time tonight. I don't know, Christine, if there's one last question that you see that or comment that I'd um, squeeze one more in. Um, would, has POSD considered extending the school day? So that's a good question. And that, that was a consideration because I know that some of our um, campuses have uh, extended days, uh, but that would be something that would need to be negotiated with our teachers bargaining unit. And we have not um, looked at that. And I think as somebody said, our teachers are pretty spent right now. So I think that um, we were concerned about, will we have teachers teaching summer school? Um, the good news is, yes, we do have teachers that have applied, but I think that um, asking teachers for a longer day, that would need, be something that we would need to uh, meet with our bargaining unit and see if we would be able to negotiate that. And can I squeeze in one more? Um, so in addition to the additional um, mental health staffing, um, does, do we need to fund social emotional wellness or mental health screenings for all students? So I, that, that is a good question. I think that 
there are screenings that are probably that are available. I think our social workers will all be able to bring that resource into the, the work that we're doing, as well as our counselors. I know there are um, quite a few tools that we can utilize. We will be doing the California Healthy Kids Survey in May, and that is a high level screening tool about how kids are feeling. And then that will help us to see some broad patterns and trends that we can then um, craft follow-up and get more specific. And I know I, I spoke with a principal today and she said she's done a couple of surveys with her students with just some super simple questions like on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling about being prepared for eighth grade next year? And she said the data that she got back just from a simple question was um, really critical that she was able to then work with the teachers. They were able to look at which kids were saying, I don't feel prepared, I don't feel ready and able to take, in, take action right now. So I think that we can work with our social workers, our counselors and have some formal screening tools. And then we can also work with our classroom teachers about some check-ins that provide some valuable insights. Um, one of the things and I just wanna share the story that we've learned through our uh, equity and inclusion work and talking with our students is um, a student had shared in one of the panels that just because I look like I'm successful on paper and my grades are good and my attendance is good, don't mistake that to think that I'm doing okay because on the inside I'm not. And so I think that idea of a screening tool is going to be really important and, and that's where ensuring um, our teachers and the trauma-informed care that we know what to look for and we know how to intervene and um, refer and have supports for our kids because that is the well-being is critical. I always say our kids need to feel safe so they can learn. They need to feel good so they can learn. So thank you again for being here tonight. I appreciate your time and your input. Uh, have a wonderful evening and again, uh, appreciate your participation and involvement in Power Unified. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.